My name is Marty Schock. I'm an engineer at Couchbase. And I work on a team called uh, Couchbase Labs. And what that really means is I'm not working on the uh, core database product. I'm not working on the SDKs. Uh, me and some of the other people get to work on some of the more uh, things related to looking at the future of the product, uh, experimenting with different ways of using our product, trying to you know, use our product in the same way as our customers so we can sort of foresee some of the, the problems they may run into. And one of the projects I've gotten to do uh, as a part of this is integrating with an Elasticsearch, which is a full text search engine. Uh, so really what I'm going to go into today is uh, really some of the new features and capabilities that's going to bring uh, to your application. So you've been hearing a lot about Couchbase Server 2.0 throughout the day. Uh, you know, really one of the big things uh, compared to 1.8 is turning, going from a key value into a, a full-fledged document database. Uh, that means having the, uh, the, the uh, distributed indexing and querying uh, using incremental MapReduce. And that adds a lot of features to your application, right? That gives you a new way to access your data uh, that you didn't have before. But sometimes it's still not all that you want. Uh, sometimes you really do need full text search. So when we talk about full text search, what do we really mean? I mean, at a simplest level, you know, we're, we're talking about a document database. We're sticking JSON documents in there. What we really want to be able to do is search for a term like Abby and have that match something maybe that's in the name or maybe that's in the description. So at the simplest level, that's really what we're talking about. And to be able to give users that capability, we've integrated with a product called Elasticsearch. So why Elasticsearch? There's a, a number of uh, you know, open, uh, open source uh, technologies out there for doing full text search. Well, this is based on Apache Lucene. And this is a, a proven library. There's a lot of projects that use Lucene under the core. Uh, so it's something that you have a lot of, of trust in. Uh, it's Apache 2 license, so you have the source code available if you, if you need to dig in or you just want to understand how it's working. Uh, you have that available. It has commercial support, too, and that's going to be important for customers as they you know, want to take this into production and build you know, applications on it. You're going to want that available. Uh, next, it's distributed. So you know, one of the key properties of customers using Couchbase is they've got the easy scalability. They're able to start out with a small cluster and add nodes and grow that as they go. And you're going to need that same capability on your search infrastructure as well. So it's really important, and, and Elasticsearch provides that capability. It has really powerful uh, clustering capabilities as well. Uh, it's schema-free JSON documents, which makes it, again, a really good fit to work with Couchbase. Uh, if, you, if you've got an integration with Couchbase, someone could lob any blob of JSON into the system. And you want the, your search engine to be able to do something intelligent with that. Uh, and you don't want to have to configure it or reconfigure it every time those things change. So Elasticsearch has really great capabilities for being able to index that data out of the box. And finally, it has a RESTful API. So this means it's really easy for you to integrate. Uh, you're not worried about any sort of proprietary things. This is all like, you know, very simple to integrate with. So before I go too much further, I want to introduce some Elasticsearch terminology. Uh, and where possible, I'll try and relate that to Couchbase terminology you're already familiar with. Uh, so the first is a document. And just like with Couchbase, this is going to be a schemaless JSON document. And from the Elasticsearch point of view, it can really decompose your document into a set of fields. Uh, so again, if you had a user object, maybe they have a name, uh, email address. These are things that would be thought of as fields inside of Elasticsearch. Now, Elasticsearch has a concept of a type. And a type is really a, a particular set of mappings describing how you, what, like, what you want to do with those fields. So the best example I would give is in your, within your Couchbase bucket, you might be storing different types of documents. Maybe you have users, you know, maybe you have products, whatever it may be in your application. From Elasticsearch, you're actually able to tell that these two different documents are different types, and I want to index this document this way and this document this other way. And finally, there's a concept of an index. And you can really think of this in the simplest form, form uh, as mapping to a Couchbase bucket. Uh, so this is, again, a logical namespace where you're going to scope all your indexing and searching. And it's important to note it can contain documents of different types. And that also relates to this next item, uniqueness, which is different from Couchbase. In Couchbase, all of your documents are unique based on the ID. In Elasticsearch, they actually allow you to have two documents with the same ID, so long as they're of different types. Again, that's, that can be a powerful feature. We're not going to really go into that today, but it's important to be aware of that, because that could potentially uh, get you later on. So with that said, how does this integration work? Well, what we've done is, in Couchbase Server 2.0, we've also introduced uh, a feature called Cross Data Center Replication. And this is what allows you to take, you know, so let's say you have all your data in a cluster on the West Coast, replicate it to the East Coast, and back. And what we've done for this is we've actually made our Elasticsearch cluster look like a Couchbase cluster. 
And by doing that, we're able to, to leverage this feature to take all of our data out of Couchbase and send it into Elasticsearch in a continuous, ongoing basis. And this choice was sort of a deliberate one that we really gave us a lot of confidence that you know, we had this highly reliable stream of data going from Couchbase into Elasticsearch. You know, the same feature, it's nothing new we're inventing just for Elasticsearch. It's the same thing that we're doing all this QA and testing on to make sure it's reliable. So it gives us high confidence that we're going to have this system here where all of our documents and their changes get seen by Elasticsearch. So let's say you want to go ahead and get started. First thing you're going to need is an existing Couchbase and Elasticsearch cluster. And this could be as small as one node of each running on your laptop. That's how I do my development. That's how I do all the demos. And this can scale up to you know, a multiple node cluster of each. Uh, you may have a five node Couchbase cluster. Maybe you decide to keep the performance right, you need a 10 node Elasticsearch cluster. This is going to scale right along with that. Uh, you're going to need to install the Couchbase transport plugin. Uh, and uh, Elasticsearch makes it really easy to install these plugins. So it really is a one line command. And that command is actually going to download the latest release from GitHub and install it into your plugins folder. Once you've done the download, you uh, need to configure a few things. We've tried to keep the configuration minimal. But the first is you're going to set a password. And just being a good security uh, citizen, we don't have a default password. You're required to set that password yourself. And next, you're going to install some Couchbase index templates. So I mentioned that Couchbase supports different document types. And it has sort of default behavior built into the system, which is pretty intelligent. But what we've done is we've pre-configured a few things that we'll get into later in the talk to customize the behavior to work well with Couchbase. That's really it. Again, it takes about five minutes uh, to do the, those two steps. You can then restart Elasticsearch. And finally, you're going to create an index. Just like with cross data center replication, where you need to create the buckets on both sides beforehand, you need to do the same here. You need to go ahead and create an index uh, for your documents in Elasticsearch. Now, that's a transport plugin for Elasticsearch. So what that means is it's sort of a passive thing where Elasticsearch is just sitting there waiting to receive the documents. The next step is going back to your uh, Couchbase user interface and starting the cross data center replication. So what I've shown here is the first step in that, where you create a cluster reference. And this is where you're telling, uh, in this case, Couchbase, where is the Elasticsearch cluster. So you have to give it a name. You give it an IP address and port for one of the machines. Use that same password that you just configured in the previous step. And then hit Save. And now your cluster reference is set up. Then to actually start the transfer of documents, you're going to go ahead and create a replication. So you press the button to create a replication. You choose your bucket. I've selected beer sample here. And all the examples I'm going to give later are working with the beer sample data set. And on the remote side, we're going to select the Elasticsearch cluster. And then the bucket here is the index name in Elasticsearch. So again, we have this mapping one to one in this case of bucket to index. So again, in this case, I would call that beer sample. And really, once I hit this replicate button, data is going to start flowing uh, using the XDCR process. So if I were to switch over to the user interface of Elasticsearch, I've got a screenshot of it up here, you'll immediately see that that document count is going to start increasing. And if I reload, 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 eventually it's going to get up and it's going to you know, show the number of documents that we've indexed. So once I've done that, what can I do now? So we're going to go through a number of examples here, uh, really showing off some of the kinds of things that you can do by integrating with Elasticsearch. Uh, first, I wanted to show a sample document. Uh, you may or may not have played around with the beer data set before, but figured I'd show you a document here. This is a, a nice hipster beer to start with, Pabst Blue Ribbon, uh, PBR, as you may know it. Uh, and so there's a number of fields here. There's a name. Uh, there's an ABV, which is a numerical value, which is the uh, percent alcohol by volume. We've got a type field, a brewery ID, which is sort of a reference to another document. Uh, and for search, the last three are really kind of interesting. We have a description which I, I've truncated a bit here, but it's a longer text string. So it's going to be really useful for doing examples for searching for beer. And then we have two different uh, sort of styles and categorizations, uh, which again, we'll be able to use kind of for some cool features later on. So with that document in mind, and I've got several thousand of those loaded up, let's, what's the sort of simplest query I could do? Well, Elasticsearch exposes this REST API. So it supports GET requests. So I could literally just plug this in my browser and in this case, the, the query phrase I'm searching for is logger. And so if I run that, you're going to get a set of results coming back. Well, let's look at one of those, how those results look. So the first is it has a section called took, which is just the number of milliseconds that it took to process the request. 
Then we have total. This is the total number of documents that were returned by the search. This seems to match our expectations, right? We had 7,000 some beers. You're going to have a lot of them that are loggers or use the term logger. Uh, so that sort of fits with our expectation there. We have a maximum score. So uh, if you think of search compared to uh, a query, um, each of the documents sort of match by a certain degree. So uh, this is a, a Elasticsearch telling us how well this particular document matched. And then max is going to be the highest. So out of all the 1,000 documents, the highest score was 1.1 uh, and change. And then the final is a section of hits. And this is going to contain the actual document references themselves. So let's dive in a little deeper to one of those references. So again, this is the hits array. I'm just like, so zooming in on one of them here. And there's, there's some underscore fields, which are just internal to uh, Elasticsearch. We won't go into those. Inside of the source field is the document that we passed into Couchbase. I'm sorry, into Elasticsearch from Couchbase. So you see the meta section, which has the ID and revision. This is very useful for sort of ensuring that you've got all the right documents in your Elasticsearch index. But you might be wondering, where's the actual document itself? Like, the document I sent over was an actual beer document. And that's missing. Normally, you would expect another section under meta that would say doc and have the full contents. And now you're wondering where it is. The reason is, we've done that by design. In the index template that we set up in the very beginning, we've configured it to not store the full body of the document. And the reason is simple. You've already got the full, you've got very fast access to the full document inside of Couchbase itself. So the pattern we're recommending here, if you look at this, is first you're going to run your Elasticsearch query. That's going to return your results, which is basically a list of IDs. Then you can go back with your Couchbase SDK, issue a multi-get, get all those documents back, and then process the result. And this is a pattern we're really recommending uh, our customers look at. So if we just sort of zoom out a little bit from the architecture perspective, again, this is all going to be coordinated most likely in your application server. Uh, you've got your Couchbase cluster here, your transport, I'm sorry, the transport moving the data over to your Elasticsearch index. So whenever you're doing the direct access to the documents themselves, or if you're doing MapReduce queries, you're going to be using uh, this on the left-hand side. And then you're doing your Elasticsearch uh, and getting your document references back it's on the right-hand side. So that was a really simple query. We just did a, you know, a query for the, the term logger. Let's look at some more advanced queries we can do. So the first thing you'll notice is before we were doing an HTTP GET. And that works, but it's sort of limited in how you can express the information. So we've moved now to doing a POST to that same URL. And now we're going to post in a JSON request that actually contains the search query. So whereas before we just searched for the term logger, now I'm using a little bit more advanced syntax. I have style, lambic, and description, blueberry. And what that's going to do is, if you remember the original document we looked at, style and description are two of the fields that are in the JSON document source. So we're actually scoping the particular search to match only in those particular fields. And if we look down here, I've gone ahead and pulled that document that matched. It only matched one document. I pulled it back out of Couchbase so we could see it. It matches exactly what we expect. We look in the description field. We see the term blueberry, and if we look in the style, we see the term lambic. So it's, it's doing exactly what we want. Another very popular feature with Elasticsearch and, and just full text search in general is faceted search. Uh, I have a screenshot here uh, browsing sort of a, a major electronics website, and I think I searched for the term SSD. And you're used to seeing these kind of results where it's allowing you to see various categories, brand, price, rating. And then within of those are different uh, terms that are going to match uh, and have a certain number of documents that match that particular term. So in this case, the brands, you see that iOmega has two next to it, or OCZ Technologies has one. And again, this is a very useful way for users to sort of, they don't know exactly what they're looking for, but when they see the results, they sort of realize, OK, I did want this particular manufacturer. I'm going to drill into that and gradually drill in deeper to the results. Uh, and I also want to highlight another, the, the, the term one is sort of obvious if you have you know, a list of, of low cardinality terms describing a particular field. But sometimes you have a numerical value. In this case, it was the price. And so another feature is doing what we call range facets, where you can set up range categories and then pull back those same counts within those ranges. So I'm actually going to go through, using the beer sample data set, two examples, you know, one of each of these. The first we're going to look at is uh, a faceted search on the beer style. Um, so this will be useful. In this case, I'm going to search for the term bud. And I want to have it bring back the style of the beer. So you notice the facet section. Again, the actual JSON syntax is not that important here. But the important thing is we're telling it the field style. And in this case, I'm limiting it to three results. 
And if I were to run this query, here are the results I get. And something looks wrong here. Uh, if you remember that original one we looked at, the, the, the styles were much longer, and here these are all single terms. So I've got the actual term is style, then the term is logger, and then the term is American. So if we think about what actually happened here, we think the style was probably on at least one or multiple of these American style logger. And what happened was Elasticsearch analyzed that text, which was what it would do by default for a string, and it's tokenizing that up into three different pieces. And so it did sort of, sort of intelligent default behavior, but now that we want to use this as a facet field, that's not, the, that's not what we want. So I left this in here because this is a really common example you're going to run into when you adopt Elasticsearch. It has great default behavior, but it's just not always perfect in every case. So how do we fix that? First thing we can do is update the mapping. So again, it has a default mapping, but we want to override that and change the behavior a little bit. So what we can do, it's as simple as doing a put request uh, to this particular URL, which is basically saying in the beer sample index for the couch-based documents, I want to change the mapping. And I can just, all the defaults are going to stay in play, but I'm just going to override the behavior for one of the fields called style. And I'm going to set index not analyzed. Now, there are a couple other uh, values that you could choose there, depending on what behavior you're looking for. But not, al not analyzed is the simplest one that's going to give us the behavior we're looking for. Now, it's important to note, when you change the mapping, you do need to re-index your data. So this is something you're going to want to do during development time. You're going to want to play around with this and find out what the right mapping is for your particular data. Uh, because it's going to be an expensive operation if you have to do that later. And if we just make that change and we were to run the same faceted query again, now the results a lot look a lot more like what we expected. Uh, American style light logger has five, uh, American style logger has two, and Belgian style white is one. So with just that minor change, we were able to get the functionality we we're looking for. Now the next one I want to look at is the alcohol, the percent alcohol range. So uh, we saw that all the values have a, a floating point value, which is the alcohol by volume. And what I've defined is three ranges here, which would correspond to a low, medium, and high alcohol content. And again, it's as simple as just saying 2, 3, which will basically be between you know, 0 and 3, from 3 to 5, and then anything above 5. And it's really that simple. Again, I'm just telling you it's the, it's the ABV field and providing those ranges. And if I run this query, it's going to give us these results. Oh, we looked at the results. So the next feature I want to turn to is search results scoring. So we, I mentioned earlier that we had a section that said the maximum score. Each individual document has a value in that hit section that has the score. Uh, and so that's great. It, it, sort of, it has some meaning on its own that tells us how well a particular document matched. But there's actually a lot of features in Elasticsearch that give us deeper control over that same field. So what we can do is we can have custom scoring. So I was trying to think of an example. And the simplest example I could come up with was, what if I wanted to rank all of the higher alcohol content beers higher? And I could do that just by simply providing this additional script. Underscore score is the sort of the natural score that Elasticsearch is assigned to it. And then by using the syntax doc ABV value, I'm able to multiply that by the score. And that's going to, at the time I'm running this, essentially multiply all of the natural scores by the alcohol content. Uh, so that'll have a nice effect on our search results. I don't, I don't have the example here, but you can, you can see how that's going to work. It's still a contrived example, though. So I wanted to give a more realistic example. Uh, what if we had a system, a website maybe, where users could rank the beer styles that they're interested in on, and sort of how well they like a particular style of beer? Uh, you can envision a screen where they have, you know, maybe they star, put a number of stars next to the different types. So what I've done here is I've done a search for the term bud again, and I haven't done any weighting at all. This is sort of the natural results that come back. Uh, bud extra didn't have any style associated with it, but that's not that important. I've got all the scores on the right-hand side. So again, a user coming to the site for the first time that would run the search would see these results. But if I've gone in and I've, as my user, have ranked that I like Belgian-style whites, and I've rated that with a score of 10, I can then run the same query again, but I'm just going to provide this additional filter here called, it's a term filter, and it's saying, okay, for if the style matches Belgian style white, boost it by 10. So it's very simple to implement. And now if I do that, you see that uh, Bud Light Golden Wheat, which had been the, the third beer in the list, has now bumped up. It's now the top item in the list, which makes sense. That's the one I boosted the score. Uh, for the style that I like. And you see the score is 10 times what it was before, which was the boost factor that I had passed in. So you see, uh, this is a really simple way where you can you know, add a lot of like, user uh, you know, customized search results to your application. 
And this is a great segue. If you saw uh, Chris C's talk earlier, uh, he talked about the learning, learning portal proof of concept. Uh, this was a uh, proof of concept that we collaborated with them on uh, to build an, app, an actual application where we used Couchbase server features and Elasticsearch together. And we're going to be doing a demo of this later, so I won't spend too much time talking about it here. But the key thing is we've powered you know, things like the top contributors, uh, top tags. We've powered that using Couchbase views. And then we've got search uh, capabilities on the right-hand side where we're actually using the custom scoring. So those, those two examples I gave of the custom scoring, we're actually using those in the application to provide user content. So if you come to the demo later, what I'll actually be able to do is show you logged in as two different users. Just by changing those sliders, we're able to get the same results or we get different results, depending on how the different user preferences line up. Next, uh, there's a couple next steps. So really, I'm, you know, I talked a lot about the features of, of Elasticsearch here, but I'm really just scratching the surface. So there's a lot more capability that it has to offer. The first would be customizing the document mappings. Uh, I went through one example where I customized the document mapping uh, because really sometimes the default behavior isn't what you want, but there are a lot of other you know, scenarios where you may want to customize that. And the most important one to highlight is that you may not think of at first is indexing one field multiple ways. Uh, this is something that you sort of commonly do in Elasticsearch or any search engine where you've got a particular field and you're using it in a couple different contexts. Uh, so that's, that's, I would say that's probably the most common thing you're going to do when you go to index your data. You're going to find in some cases, you want to ignore the field entirely. In some cases, you want to index it this way. So that's definitely a feature to read up on. Uh, the next would be advanced cluster topologies. So uh, Couchbase has a really simple philosophy. Uh, all the nodes are the same in the network. It makes it really easy to scale. And Elasticsearch has some different characteristics. Because query is sometimes a very CPU-intensive operation, uh, it has some more advanced features for dedicating nodes just to handling queries. So, it's worth looking into that, especially as you go to production and you start looking at larger installations, maybe you have a 20-node cluster, you may want to start getting into some of these features where you dedicate, okay, only these 10 nodes are for data, some of these nodes are just responsible for routing and querying, and it's definitely something you need to read up on. Uh, and finally would be the rich query DSL. Uh, some of those JSON snippets that we're using to issue the queries, you could see they're starting to get a little bit complicated, they're starting to get nested pretty deeply. Uh, and that's really a good thing because what it means is all these different features that Elasticsearch offers, they all fit together and work really well together. Uh, the downside is the JSON gets complicated. So it's, it's worth exploring the rich query DSL. Uh, I put a link to the Elasticsearch guide here, which is a good introduction to that. But even in that guide, it's not always obvious how you mix and match these things. So this is definitely an area where I would suggest, you know, you spend some time. If you have an idea of how to do something, and you think it should be able to do it, I'm almost certain it can. But the, the guide's not always going to make it clear how. So this is definitely something where you can engage with us and we can work with you and uh, get, get the solution working for you. In terms of the actual adapter itself, the future, uh, what we uh, just released uh, just the other day is a developer preview. Uh, and I have a blog article about that on the website. I'll show you a link to that later. And really, the, the main thing we want to do is get this to a 1.0 release. So uh, as Couchbase Server moves from its beta to eventually being a GA release, we're going to be doing updates of this uh, transport so that we make sure that it works with the current versions that are released. And then shortly after that, we eventually hope to move out and have a 1.0 release of the adapter itself. I've listed a couple features here that we're thinking about. So uh, right now, a lot of the configuration that you can do is done at the cluster level. Uh, and that's, that's useful. It certainly gets you up and running. But again, as you start doing more complex deployments, you're going to find there's things where you'd like to change the behavior of our plugin on a per index basis. So that's something we're going to consider adding a little finer grain control there. Uh, the cluster configuration itself, again, right now when you run our plugin, it has to run on all the nodes in the cluster. And it sort of takes over all the nodes in the cluster and that it's going to distribute traffic across all of them. That again, that works for small clusters, but that may not be what you want. If you have 100 nodes, you may only want it to send to 10, not to all 100. So we'd like to get some more fine grain control there as well. I listed a pre-index script execution. So uh, there's a lot of scenarios where the data that comes in from Couchbase may not be exactly what you want to index. Uh, in some cases, uh, there, again, there's some more advanced features in Elasticsearch with parent documents, child documents. There's things that you would want to manipulate there. Or it could just be as simple as wanting to manipulate the JSON structure itself. So again, it's, it's a feature that Elasticsearch offers already. They already have built-in scripting capabilities. So it's sort of a natural thing for us to go ahead and add that. Uh, but it's something we haven't done yet. And the last one I have here is indexing non-JSON data. So uh, Couchbase obviously does allow you to store data that's not JSON. 
Uh, and that data is going to get sent across the wire as well. So we'd like to think about how we could maybe do more intelligent things with that. Um, certainly, we could envision people storing either text content itself or binary content that then has text in it, like a PDF, where you may want to do some more intelligent indexing of that data as well. So that's, these are all things that we're looking at for future versions. And again, finally, we want you to give us feedback. Uh, we're at a state now where it works, and you can play around with it, and we're certainly encouraging everyone to do it. We expect a lot of people, again, it's so easy to get up and running. I think a lot of people are going like, to play, start playing around with this. And now's the right time to give us your feedback. If it does something you don't expect, or you think it should do something else, definitely let us know. So with that, I'll just end here. I have some resources on the screen. The first is the blog article that we posted on Tuesday. Uh, if anyone is interested in getting this up and running, I'd encourage you to start there. In, literally in 15 minutes, you can have your Couchbase, your Elasticsearch running and sharing data. Uh, I had the GitHub repo here. It's open source. Uh, like all the stuff we're doing, it's Apache 2 licensed. And then I have my email and Twitter info. So with that, uh, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Yep. Okay. Right. So the question was, uh, how is the size of the index on Elasticsearch going to grow as related to the, the size on the, the Couchbase side? Uh, I think the biggest thing we have there is that we're, we have, do have the savings, as you noted, that we're not storing the full document source. Uh, so really, it is a function of how you're indexing. Again, I can't give you a clear example because ultimately it's going to depend on the mapping you're using. If you have one field and you index it 10 different ways, then there's going to be a cost associated with all those different types of indexes. Uh, I, again, we can, uh, in the demo later, I can give you a sense of what the index sizes are, both for the beer sample data set uh, and for uh, the, the learning portal application. That's, the learning portal is probably a better example to look at because it's sort of real text content. Um, so I, I can look at those numbers for you. I mean, it's smaller than the, 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 in the, the Couchbase index, uh, the Couchbase total size on disk in the ones I've looked at. Um, but that, it really depends on how many indexes you're looking at there. Okay. The mapping, so the mapping, when we updated the, the mapping section, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, so that's stored in Elasticsearch. So what it does, it's on a per index basis. So uh, I mentioned in the beginning we installed those index templates. So that was with a running cluster. So what would typically happen is if you don't install anything, Elasticsearch has a set of defaults that it's going to operate on. Uh, and then when you, we install those templates, we've essentially defined a Couchbase template. So that's customizing the behavior a little bit so that it works more intelligently with, with Couchbase. Uh, and then when we updated the mapping again, we're setting a third rule that's sort of overriding it. So these are all sort of layered together, and it merges them together uh, to create the configuration that it's going to use for a particular index. Now, those are all stored by Elasticsearch. So it's, it's sort of a black box. You have your Elasticsearch cluster. You run these HTTP commands. It's distributing that information around so that all the nodes in the cluster that are working with that index know about that configuration. Uh, and then they persist that as a part of their, their own cluster state. Yeah. Um, so the question was, do we have any plans for solar integration? Um, I, I don't, we certainly don't have any specific plans that I know about. Um, I think I've heard that there may even be some customers that already have built their own integration with solar. Um, so that would be you know, one possibility if, if people were willing to step up and share some information about that. Um, we'd, we're literally looking towards you know, opening up and finding other ways, you know, sort of standardizing a little bit on how people can integrate with Couchbase. Right? We'd love to have an ecosystem of you know, people integrating all these different tools, tools we haven't even thought of yet being able to integrate. So we're definitely looking for making it easier to integrate those things. And I think, that, that I don't have anything direct to give you, but we, we're certainly looking in that direction. We'd like it to be easier for people to integrate these other products with it. So the plugin that, that I've listed here has a dependency on another project called uh, Couchbase Cappy Server. I would recommend you start there. That gives you, if you want to build it in the exact same style as this, that gives you a way that you can sort of leverage. It's basically going to give you a, an interface that's going to call back to when it gets new data. So right now, we've implemented that for this plugin to take that data and hand it off to Elasticsearch. You could do a very similar style where you take that data and you hand it off to Solar. So again, if you have more questions along those lines, I'd certainly be willing to help and answer any questions I can um, if you have, have issues there. And Solar is equivalent to Elasticsearch? They're both actually built on Lucene. So at the level of like what they're doing on disk, they're very similar. What they've built on top of that is different in a lot of ways. Um, I think. The reason Elasticsearch was more appealing to us was, uh, from my perspective, it's a little more robust in terms of the uh, clustering support. Um, I know that's changed with Solar, so again, I I'm not, don't have much of an opinion on that, but that, that's why we went with Elasticsearch. Uh, one other difference, again, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard, is that Solar, it works better if your JSON has a very flat structure. 
uh, whereas Elasticsearch can take these like arbitrarily nested structures. So again, you should check that, but that's another thing I've heard is a big difference. Right. Uh, so the good thing, because of the way XDCR works, um, it's going to sort of just churn through those on a per view bucket basis. So what can happen is, yes, you're, you're, if you think about it, depending on how you, it all depends on how you have the, the I.O. managed on your, your cluster. So if you have a, you may need a bigger Elasticsearch cluster if you want it to stay current. But let's say you don't. Let's say you have a three-node Couchbase and a three-node Elasticsearch. You would expect that the Elasticsearch is going to fall behind because the indexing it's doing is more CPU intensive. It's probably going to fall further behind. Uh, but because of the way that the cross data center works, it's fine falling behind, right? It's, it's based on the disk. So it's not like you're going to cause your Couchbase server to run out of memory or anything. It's, it's all disk-based. So it'll just keep churning away and feeding documents in you know, until it eventually catches up. We've, the question is basically, sort of at a high level, I would say, why didn't we go for a tighter integration with text search? Is that a, a fair way to, to say it? Um, and we've, we've certainly had those discussions. Um, a lot of the people, that early adopters, have asked sort of the same question. Even internal at Couchbase, we've, we've sort of had those same discussions. Um, the short answer I'll give you is there's a lot of benefits to actually having a separate infrastructure, particularly if you're looking at a larger deployment. Um, the scaling needs of your Couchbase cluster and your full text cluster end up being different. Um, some of them, so for example, if I run a search which requires a lot of CPU while it's doing all of its work, do I want that to slow down my, you know, get and set operations on my key value store? Yeah, obviously you don't want it to. Um, now in a simple configuration, maybe that's okay, but when you're really looking to really scale this out, uh, it's more useful to have them separate. So um, it's a good question and I think it's, it's fair that we keep evaluating that because as Couchbase gets more advanced in future versions, sometimes these trade-offs will change over time. I'd say, you know, filtered replication is something that is longer term going to be coming to the XDCR as well, um, but we don't have any actual date for that. So right now, it would come down to two options, both of which on the destination side. So they're still going to get transmitted across, and it's just a matter of filtering them out on the destination side. Uh, the first would be using the document type feature. So the example I gave here, and in the version we've released right now, all the documents map to a single type just called Couchbase document. And you can override, you can change the default, but you can't like, make it dynamic. So before we get the 1.0 release of this out, we're going to have a, what, what I call a, a dynamic document type, which would allow you to look at a field in your JSON document and, and use that. So in the beer example, you know, we had beers and breweries both in the data set. What you'd like to do is, when we get it, we look at the type field, if that's what's been configured to look at, and then create two different document types in, in the Elasticsearch side. Now, that's only the first half. The second half would be, then we could use those mapping features we looked at and we could tell it, okay, for this, maybe for this one type, don't store it on disk and don't index it because I don't ever want to see those results. So that would be a, a relatively simple way of throwing away some of the data that, that got sent across. Uh, and then the, the other option is, I mentioned the, the script execution as well. So the scripting, if you look at some of the Elasticsearch rivers, they'll frequently have an option in the script where you could just set a flag like ignore. And so if the document comes in and your script sets the flag to ignore, then you don't even bother indexing it. So I think... One way or another, we'll, we'll have good ways for users to do that. Um, longer term, you really want to filter it out on the source side so you didn't even send it. So. Another question here? So right Deleted documents we can't ignore because we actually need to delete them from the search index as well. So what happens is when the cross data center replication sends a, a bulk request of 1,000 documents, let's say, across, there's a flag if it's deleted. So if it's not deleted, we update the index with that document. If it's deleted, we tell it to remove that document from the index. But that's what our plugin has to do. Our plugin has to look at that and apply the right behavior in Elasticsearch to sort of map the two. And it does that. It does that, yeah. Okay, yep. we have five more minutes. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I guess not. So again, I'll be doing a demo of the Learning Portal application during the uh, happy hour. So it's another opportunity to see the search in action and ask any other questions you have then. So thank you.